house of the Lord this morning. Amen? Yes. Amen. Man, it is such an honor just to worship along with you, to worship together as a family, um, as a fellowship of believers in this place. It is just awesome, and I praise God for that this morning. So um, as you know, we are preparing for Easter. We are starting our Easter series today, and we will be meeting together today. Also want to invite you to be here on Friday um, at 6 p.m. for our Good Friday services. And then, of course, next Sunday, we are just planning to pack this place out as we celebrate our resurrected King. And then also in that on Tuesday, we just didn't want to leave any night out this week. <laughs> We're having a night of prayer on Tuesday. And I know that is a lot, but as we prepare this week and are, are entering into the Holy Week, as uh, we would celebrate in the um, Old Testament and Jewish tradition, you know, there is nothing more that we need to be doing this week, thinking about this week, focusing in on this week than what Christ has done for us. Amen? And so this morning we're going to start, and um, as you know, today is Palm Sunday, and the, the kind of series begins this morning with welcoming the King on Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is something that was a very significant event um, in the life and times of Jesus Christ and all that took place there. It's also a very significant event for us today that we're going to be talking about. And Palm Sunday is something that um, it is the beginning, is the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. It begins the Holy Week. And it is also something that is found and celebrated in all four of the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we know that those are four different authors who wrote basically the story and the life of Jesus Christ. And in the Gospels, there are certain things that are touched on more than others, depending upon the writer or the Gospel. But the triumphal entry of Christ is found in all four Gospels and um, is basically written out in a very similar way way and so we want to just um, celebrate all that today is and I'll, I'll be really honest with you Palm Sunday is one of those things that's a little bit difficult when you read the account of uh, the Jesus entry into Jerusalem which we will do today it is magnificent and it's wonderful and everything about it sounds great and mighty but we in the church know <laughs> what is to come we know ultimately the resurrection is, is coming, but we also know that Good Friday is coming. We know that the crucifixion is coming. And so we're going to talk about that today and how it relates to each one of us in our own lives. And so we're going to read this morning from John 12, verses 12 through 19. You've already heard this this morning in our opening, and we're going to be reading it again. Let's read. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. It says, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, the disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now, the crowd that was with him call, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed these signs, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Let's pray. Father, we come to you again this morning, and Lord, I thank you for everything, Lord, that we will learn and participate in, that we will celebrate, and that we will remember this week. And Father, I pray this morning as we read your word and lord as we come to you um, as your humble servants lord that your word would penetrate our hearts and our minds father i have nothing to offer but lord i ask that you would allow me to be your vessel this morning father as you speak the truth of your word upon the hearts of your people we love you and we praise you and we ask these things in jesus name amen so a lot of you know that john and i when we were um, in our journey, prior to this journey, we worked with teenagers for many, many years. 
And one of my favorite things that we got to do as youth leaders was be part of something that was called Unite. And we, we came from a community of about 6,000 people. And in that community, we had about six or seven churches who formed something called Unite Ministries. And basically what that was, it was a monthly or a quarterly meeting and then a summer conference where we would bring all of our youth groups together and we would unite for the, for the purpose and the, and the cause of God's kingdom. And it was so cool because even though we, only, we had about six or seven kind of core groups who organized that, I remember there was one summer that we had a conference and there were 23 different churches from our small community that were represented at that Unite service. Probably one of my favorite Unite services that we ever got to be a part of was after Pastor Dylan had actually come um, to know Jesus Christ and we had a service. And in this community of 6,000 people, a school district of maybe around 1,200 students, there were over 500 high school kids in this service. And it was amazing, and, and what God was doing was amazing, and kind of the, the revival that was taking place within our community. Um, it's kind of crazy. I remember we even would get uh, text messages, or people would send us pictures of, of students who would be gathered at the school and praying and having Bible study and all these things that were taking place. At one time, one of the administrators actually called me, and he was also a believer, and he was excited about what was going on, but, but he said, I just need to know what's going on. Like, what is going on here? What is the deal? These, these students that were in the school that we were um, trying to get, you know, ran down for running drugs and all these different things, like, they're leading Bible studies in the commons at school. Like, what is going on here? And as amazing as that was... I remembered thinking to myself that it was kind of like the triumphal entry. Like Jesus had come in and, and revival was beginning and people were exciting and the crowd was excited and the students were excited and everything seemed so good and positive and it, and it was. But we know this about the triumphal entry of Jesus. That there's going to be resurrection. There's going to be new life. But before resurrection comes, there is going to be a season of death. And I knew that in the lives of those students, that Jesus loved them and Christ wanted to resurrect them and Christ wanted to make them new and Christ wanted to walk in relationship with each and every one of them. And they were excited because the crowd was excited. But I knew that for the resurrection to happen and for new life to be placed in each and every one of them, there was going to have to be a season of death. That they were going to be faced with things in their lives that were not pleasing to the Lord. And when their expectations were not met, and when the crowd began to become silent and, and the attitude of the crowd began to change and their circumstances didn't look the way that they wanted them to look and God began to pull away the layers and began to ask them to die out to self, would they continue to follow the king? And so the title of my sermon this morning would be this. Welcome the king regardless. Welcome the king regardless. You see, there is a time in each and every one of our lives as followers of Jesus Christ that we're going to have to look at different areas of our lives and di different situations in our lives and the crowd that we are in and the circumstances that we have and the expectations that have been placed in our mind and we are going to have to decide just like we sang this morning. I will follow Christ. I will welcome the king into my life regardless. And so here is my focus this morning. If Christ is the king of our life, we will welcome him regardless of the expectations, the crowd, or the circumstances. If he is going to be king of your life, you will welcome him regardless of the expectations, the crowd, or the circumstances. So first of all this morning, I want to look at what it is to welcome Christ as king 
regardless of your expectations. We go back and we read the passage in John that we read this morning, and it says this. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And we know that there was a great crowd following Jesus because he had been in his public ministry. He had been healing people, t changing water into wine, making the deaf to hear and the blind to see. And so he had this following. And it says they took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And we get the, the, the idea of Palm Sunday is because this was the first day of the week when Jesus entered into Jerusalem and the palm branches were kind of like, you know, their little wavy things to celebrate him coming in. We wouldn't probably use palm branches today, but we would use some type of lights or techo, techno or whatever, right? But they, would, they were waving the palm branches and not only were they waving palm branches, but they were lining the roads with the palm branches because all of Jerusalem was open to him. The streets were open to him and he was being celebrated as a king as he was led in through the city. And we often think of the word Hosanna as a declaration of praise. This morning we certainly sang Hosanna as a declaration of praise. And for believers it is. But it is actually a plea for salvation. The Hebrew root word, we find those in Psalms 118.25, which says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. The Hebrew word yasha means to deliver or to save. And the word anna is beg or beseech. So when you put those two words together to form the English word hosanna, it literally means we beg you to save us. Please deliver us. And so as he was walking in through Jerusalem that day and they were shouting Hosanna, they were begging him to save them. They were begging him to deliver them. The only problem is they were not seeking deliverance from sin. They were seeking deliverance from their expectations and from their circumstances. They were seeking salvation from the Roman Empire. And so as he comes in and, and he enters in and finally he has been made public and, and we know that the fulfillment happened when we see um, him riding in on a, on a donkey that comes from Zechariah 9.9 9, and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt the foal of a donkey. And even though this was prophesied and written in the Old Testament and the scholars knew that it was, he did not fulfill the expectation that they had for him. See, Jesus rides into the capital city as a conquering king and he is hailed by the people and he ascends to his palace, but yet his palace is not a temporal palace. His palace is is a spiritual place. It is, the, it is the temple. And no longer does he tell his disciples to keep quiet and to be quiet, but he allows them to worship him openly and publicly. They are asking him to lead them in a, in a revolt against Rome. The people are, that they would be saved from their enemies, that they would be saved from Roman rule. And when he did not meet their expectations, not only did they no longer cry Hosanna, but the same crowd began to cry, crucify him. And we know how the story goes, and we can look at that story, and we think, you know, how could they do that? I, we would never have done that. But yet in our lives... When he does not fulfill the expectation, when he does not meet the expectation that you and I place on him as Savior and Lord, we stop praising him and we begin to criticize his power and his role in our life. And we will also eventually crucify him in our life as Savior. 
We have to come to the understanding today that Christ is king regardless of your unmet expectations. I'll tell you, I went through a season in my life where the unmet expectations that I had almost destroyed me. And some of you have heard that testimony in length, and I won't share it in length today. But here's what I know. If I hadn't decided that Christ was king, regardless of my expectations of what my life would look like or my calling would look like or the plans that he had for me would look like, I would not be standing before you today. He must be king in your life, regardless of unmet expectations. I want to read this morning um, also from Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, and this is what it says. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Aren't you glad this morning that you serve a God whose ways are higher than your ways, whose thoughts are higher than your thoughts, who knows what the story looks like from beginning to end? Aren't you glad this morning that you serve a Lord and a Savior that you can trust in your unmet expectations, knowing that they are not failures, knowing that they are not incomplete stories, but that he is writing the story, he is completing the story, if we will simply trust him in his ways and his thoughts this morning. He must be king regardless of our expectations. The next thing I want to look at this morning is that Christ is king regardless of the crowd. In John uh, verse 17, 12 verse 17, it says, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. The crowd that was with him when he, lay, when he raised Lazarus up from the dead that, that saw this tremendous miracle. They were the crowd that was with him entering into Jerusalem. And it says that they continued to spread the word. Well, I just wonder what the word was <laughs> that they were spreading. They were talking of all of the miracles, the signs and wonders that Jesus had accomplished. And while Jesus performed many miracles, that is not what he came to this earth to do. It's so important that we understand that this morning. I'm going to read this morning from John 12, 27. This is why Jesus came. The heading here is Jesus predicts his death, and this is what he says. Now my soul is deeply troubled Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour, speaking of the crucifixion. But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem on that day and they were shouting his name and praising him and and glorifying him, he knew exactly where he was headed. And when we celebrate him and we praise him today, we have to understand that he chose the cross. He chose the cross for us, even though the crowd didn't understand. If you go on and read in John 12, 34, it says the crowd responded. So this was the crowd's response to what Jesus knew he had to do. We understand from scripture that the Messiah would live forever. How can you say that the Son of Man will die? Just who is this Son of Man anyway? They began to question. There began to be doubt in who Jesus said that he was. And as the crowd began to doubt, it began to impact what they would do next. I remember in, that, in the journey when I was talking about and, and the revival season that we had, it was so 
awesome, you know, when everybody was excited and everybody was praising us for doing a good job and helping these teenagers. But I also remember when the tone of the crowd shifted. I remember when people began to say terrible things about my family. And I remember when people began to say questionable things about our church. And I remember when people went from praising Pastor Dylan for the changes that God had made in his life to being incredibly critical of him. I even remember there were two or three different families whose young people had come to know Christ. Keep in mind, these were young people who were doing drugs. They were on drugs. They were being promiscuous. They were making very poor choices in their life. And they had found Jesus Christ. And God had changed them so radically that it was apparent to everybody who knew them. And I remember sitting down with three different sets of parents who came into our home not to thank us, not to praise God for helping get their child off drugs, but to question what our motives were, to question what we were doing, to ask us why their student couldn't just be a normal Christian. Every one of them entered into our home and said, listen, we're Christians. Listen, we go to church. Listen, my kid was already a Christian. My kid was already saved. My kid was already a follower of Christ. And, and whatever this you're trying to do with them is, listen, we just want them to be a normal Christian. <laughs> they don't need to be going to church every night. They don't need to be leading Bible studies in their school. They don't need to be telling everybody they come in contact with about what God has done in their life. Listen, that's not how we do Christianity. And I remember when the tone of the crowd began to change. I want to read also this morning from John 12, 42 through 43, and this is what it says. This, you've got to hear this this morning. This is speaking about the course of events that we're going to be talking about over this next week. John 12, 42 through 43, it said, Many people did believe in him, however. Many people did believe in him, including some of the Jewish leaders. But they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Do you hear that this morning? Some of the religious leaders believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that he was who he said he was. And they were fearful to tell the leaders and the priests in the synagogue because they thought they would be expelled. And they would have been. The crowd. The influence of the crowd. You know, this morning, you may feel like you're not really influenced by the, by the big crowd. You may feel like that you're not really influenced by society. Maybe it doesn't have a big impact on you. But every single one of us in here has a crowd of influence. Now, your crowd of influence may only be two or three people. Your crowd of influence may be hundreds of people. I don't know. But you have a crowd of influence. And whether or not you will truly receive Jesus Christ and you will truly welcome him as your King of kings and Lord of lords will be influenced by your crowd. And did you know that sometimes in the church, within our Christian circles, that the influence that, is, that the enemy has over us is fear. If I speak up, if I say something, if, if I don't, if I, maybe I need to just pull it back a little bit. Maybe I just need to tone it down a little bit because I, I'm fearful that even in my Christian sphere of influence, that if I really did what I think God's calling me to do or I really said what I think God's calling me to say, that they, that they would reject me. Who is your crowd of influence? And then there are those of us who are influenced by a crowd who is completely not walking with the Lord. And yet we allow them to speak truth into our lives, their form of truth. We allow them to have influence over us. Who is your crowd of influence this morning? Galatians 1.10 says this, Obviously, I am not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. 
If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. This morning, are you motivated to be a servant of Christ? Or are you motivated to please people? Because we often can't do both. Christ must be king regardless of your crowd of influence. The last area I want to look at this morning is that Christ is king regardless of circumstances. Going back to John 12, verse 18, it says, Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. The whole world has gone after him. You see, they weren't interested in serving Jesus Christ because they loved him. They were interested in serving and following him because they wanted to see what they could get out of it. And how many of us, this very statement, for this is getting us nowhere. You know, I tried that whole Christian thing. I tried that whole following Jesus thing. I tried that whole going to church thing. And you know what? It didn't get me nowhere. We must follow Christ regardless of our circumstances. I cannot tell you how many times that John and I have sat in a room so excited with individuals who maybe are coming back to Christ or maybe coming to Christ for the very first time. And we begin to talk to them and ask them, you know, how's the Lord speaking into your life? What truth is he showing you? Uh, What is he showing you through prayer? Or what is he showing you through his word? And the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, well, I've got this situation. You see, I'm I'm out of money. I I, I need the Lord to bless me. Well, well, see, my circumstance is that that my spouse is is leaving me. You know, my husband is leaving or my my wife is leaving. My circumstance is that the doctors have said there there is no hope. And, And so... They want to give their life back to Christ so that he will change their circumstance. The reality of it is, all throughout Scripture, rarely do you see Jesus change people's circumstances. But what he does is he uses their circumstances to change them. God is not really interested in changing your circumstances. More than likely, he has placed you in those circumstances or allowed you to be placed in them. But what he is interested in doing is not saving you from your circumstances, but saving you from your sin. It is an eternal salvation. It is a salvation that is not temporal or momentary or or about a circumstance. It is a salvation that is promised to us of an eternity with our heavenly Father. We must welcome him as Christ, Christ as King, regardless of our circumstances. Here's what John 16, 33 has to say. It says, I have told you these these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But I have overcome the world. Jesus never promises a life without trouble. He never promises a life without trial. He never promises us a life without sickness. He never promises us a life without death. In fact, he says very clearly that those things are coming. You are going to experience difficult circumstances. But what he does promise us is that he has overcome this world this temporal world that is, tempor- that is temporary. Man, we get so stinking caught up in this world and the things that this world has to offer us. We all do. This is the beginning. This is the beginning. And the decisions and the choices that you make in this life will impact you and everyone around you for the rest of eternity 
It is real. It is eternal. And we all have a choice to make. Christ is king regardless of your circumstances. So here's my question for you this morning. What motivates you to follow Christ? Honestly, you know, the crowd was motivated by his miracles. They were motivated because they thought he was going to fulfill their expectations and overcome their circumstances. And I'm going to tell you this morning, if that is the reason that you are motivated to follow Christ, you will be disappointed. So then what is it that motivates you? I think, you know, most of us, we want to live an ethical life. We want to be well thought of. You know, maybe you've been motivated to follow Christ because you want your kids to be brought up in church. Or, or maybe you have a crowd of influence who's drawing you to church, who's bringing you to church. That's awesome. But ultimately, we must decide, just like we sang in that song this morning, that I will follow Christ regardless. Craig Grishel is a pastor and a teacher. He does a leadership training on motivation. And we were listening one day to his training on motivation. And, you know, we all tend to say, well, this person's not very motivated or that person's not very motivated or this person's highly motivated. And I'll never forget what he said because it so impacted me. He said, all people have equal motivation. All people have equal motivation. It just depends on what motivates you. If you sit on the couch all day and eat Doritos and play video games, you are highly motivated to sit on the couch all day and eat video, eat video games, watch video games, right? That is your motivation. You are motivated. We are equally motivated. What is it that motivates you to follow Christ? If it is anything other the desiring to know Him and be known by Him in an obedient love relationship. You're not going to make it to the cross. What motivates you? My next question to you this morning would be this. How much are you influenced by your expectations, your unmet expectations, your crowd of influence, and your circumstances? Let's be honest this morning. Lord, it'd be a whole lot easier for me to praise you if you would fill in the blank. When you don't get the test results that you were anticipating, when you don't get the promotion that you were working toward, when your kids don't do the things that you would like for them to do, will you still welcome him as the king of your life? The last question I have for you this morning is simply this. Will you welcome Christ as king regardless? Regardless. Because you see, he comes into our hearts and it is, it's a triumphant entry and it's so exciting and it's wonderful and, and we're so um, looking forward to what it's going to look like to live a life with Christ. And we want him to save us from our sins, but to be honest, we want him to save us from a whole lot of other things as well. And when we begin to understand that, that our expectations may look different or may not be met in the way that we want them to be met, here's what we have to understand. He is forming us. He is shaping us. He is molding us. Yes, He is killing us. Do you, do you know what I mean by that? Not physically, but spiritually. He is killing off self and selfishness and selfish desires. He is removing me from the situation so that I can be fully used by Him. That's what it is to walk with Christ. People may not talk about that very often, but there is a second work of grace that once he enters into your heart that he begins to sanctify you and he begins to set you apart not to harm you but because he loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life there's going to be a season of death but when those things have been surrendered 
when those expectations and those friends and that crowd and those circumstances have been surrendered to Christ, He can do something in and through you that you never imagined possible as He brings new life, as He resurrects His power within you this morning. Jesus came to deliver them. He did. He absolutely came to deliver them. But He came to deliver them from their sin. And that is what He has come for, for each of us this morning as well. I want to read this last passage of Scripture as we prepare to close this morning. It comes from 1 Peter 2, 6 through 7. And it talks about Jesus, the cornerstone. We sang about that this morning. And here's what it says. It says, for this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a chosen stone, a precious cornerstone. And he who believes in him will never be disappointed. Well, Selena, you just said he's not going to meet my expectations. He's not going to come in and save me from my circumstances. Oh, but we are talking about a much, much deeper salvation experience here where he, where he saves you from those things, from your expectations, from your circumstances. And in him, you will never be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief corner stone. I want you to stand with me in this place this morning. And, and we have to decide in our lives this morning, will we follow Christ? Will we welcome him in as king regardless? And as, as we respond this morning, if you are here this morning and you have never had the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, we want to invite you to do that this morning. But maybe you are here this morning and you are walking with Christ. You have received Christ. Man, I'm just going to invite you this morning to respond to Him again in just total obedience and surrender. As you say to Him this morning, as we prepare in this holy week, Jesus, I welcome you, my cornerstone, my all in all. You are enough. You are the one. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. And, fa and Father, I will follow you and I will choose you and I will welcome you regardless, regardless of my crowd, regardless of my expectations, regardless of my circumstances, Father, I will follow you. Lord, we ask these things in your precious and holy name this morning. I invite you to come and to pray at this time. Hey, I'm Dylan Robinson, one of the pastors here at The Well. Thank you so much for listening to this sermon. We hope the Lord spoke to you through it. If you have any questions about the message, your faith, or any way that we can pray for you, please visit the contact page of our website. We would love to meet you in person, so come and see us. Here at The Well, we believe all people can be found by the grace of God, filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, and free to love like Christ. Have a blessed week, and remember, you are loved by God.